Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's community conversation. I'm Megan Steele. I'm a volunteer here at Sierra Club Maine. Um, and I'm just quickly introducing things and then I'm going to turn it over to our presenters. Um, so I just quickly want to do a few housekeeping things. Um, we just, I know that we're all, <laughs> we've all been on Zoom for uh, over almost two years now. Um, but we just ask that you keep your microphone on mute throughout the presentation to help with background noise. So you'll see a microphone symbol on the lower left of your screen. If the microphone symbol is crawled through, you're muted. Um, next to that, you'll see a video camera symbol. You're welcome to be on camera or off camera, whatever you choose. We are recording this webinar. So if you wish not to be seen, feel free to turn your video off. Lastly, we invite you to put any questions in the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat and um, I think our presenters and Becky will also have their eye on that. And then we'll have some time at the end of the presentation for Q&A. <clears throat> and then next, I just want to say that Sierra Club Maine acknowledges indigenous land and sovereignty. So we are in the homeland of the Wabanaki, the people of the dawn. We extend our respect and gratitude to the many indigenous people and their ancestors whose rich histories and vibrant communities include the Abenaki, Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, Passamaquoddy, and Penobscot nations, and all of the native communities who have lived here for thousands of generations in what is known today as Maine, New England, and the Canadian Maritimes. Sierra Club Maine is honored to collaborate with the Wabanaki as, their as they share their stories, and thanks to the Abbey Museum for their leadership and decolonization efforts in Maine. All right, so with that, I will turn it over to Becky Barto, Bar sorry, Becky Bartovix. <laughs> Becky, you're on mute. Okay, there we go. Um, hi, can you all hear me? Nope. Yes. Oh, you can. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, I um, I'm I'm really honored to have both Corey Hinton and Severine um, Fleming. Uh, join us today. This is a, a really serious issue for the state of Maine, and uh, in particular because even though our mining uh, laws were somewhat tightened up, um, they are not tight enough to prevent damage to our water quality, and I, I think we need to really force some changes in that. But in the meantime, we have an application going on in Washington County. Severine is at the center, as is Corey. Um, and so I, you know, honored to have them here. Severine is an activist I keep running into in all kinds of locations. She's very busy all over the country, um, as well as in Washington County. Um, and she has, um, is an organizer in, at, in Down East Maine um, and has been um, very keenly aware of what's been going on with this silver mine proposal uh, for Wolfden Resources. Um, it's the impact to the uh, Penamaquan and Denny's watersheds is, is uh, likely to be severe and Severine will give us some information about that. Corey is a um, uh, Passamaquoddy uh, from Sepayak and um, is a lawyer and is a leader of uh, his law firm's Tribal Nations Practice Group. And um, I'm really looking forward to hearing about um, you know, both Corey's presentation as well as Severine's on how we can move forward with this issue. And without, uh, without further ado, I'm happy to introduce Severine if you're going first or Corey, I'm not sure which one of you wanna go first, but um, oh, welcome gosh. and thank you. We didn't set that up. Probably Severine, yeah. Do you want me to go first? Yeah. Absolutely. Good. Okay, I'll go first and I'll go fast. So here we are. Thank you all for being uh, attentive to this issue that we are facing together. Um, it's really much appreciated. It's, it's very unpopular to confront the reality of extraction that implicates us all as users of computers and as um, beneficiaries of modernity to recognize that modernity is metallurgy is mining and that it means we have to work very hard um, together. So this is our website where you can find information, Pembroke Clean Water. And this is our mission, which is to keep our Cobbs Cook Bay clean. Um, how do I move my slide? Ah, I did it. So here's where we are, Cobbs Cook Bay. 
as you can see, is down east Maine, Washington County, right on the border looking over on Canada on the traditional homelands of Passamaquoddy peoples. And here on the left, you see the reversing falls, which is the boiling water that gives this bay its name and the 20 foot tides that we enjoy here create an extraordinarily uh, extraordinary marine wealth, herring, elvers, scallops, lobster, mackerel. Um, this is a place where one in 10 members of our um, community of our in our county hold a commercial fishing license. So here really we are in a place where livelihoods are very much bound to clean water and the six rivers that flow into Cobbscook Bay, of course, generative um, of that, of that um, livelihood for people's immemorial and for people still today. Not very good at moving my slides. So, and you see that Cobbscook Bay is connected here in a view that includes also our, our neighbors in Canada to the Bay of Fundy, which is this deep channel. Fundy comes from Profond in French. The deep channel um, between Nova Scotia and, and the coast of Maine, where these 60 foot tides are plunging back and forth. So this is a place where we have so much cold water coming down from the Labrador current and this extreme amount of tides again to contribute to the power of this region to, to produce fish. Now, obviously the power of this region to produce other things was tapped um, in 1770s, the town of Pembroke was settled and there were four dams put onto the Penamaquan River, um, which is the river most um, closely impacted by the mining activities that we are now here to confront. Um, and interestingly, the, the reason I got involved in any of this was because there's a beautiful historic building right at the crown um, of the Crossroads Motel where in Route 1 intersects with the Penamaquan River. And that intersection of the river and the, and the one was where the old Pembroke Ironworks was located um, that was capturing the power of the river and was part of this um, early development where there were 2,000 people in the town, sawmills, um, deforestation, obviously, but a, um, a fishery that included shad that still includes alewives and elvers um, and a new fishway that was reconstructed in um, 2020 means that according to the Downey Salmon Federation, we're looking at um, expected alewife runs in that river of 300,000 fish per year. So those alewives are part of a community fishery. Everyone's allowed to catch bait. Everyone's allowed to dip fish and um, 25 per day. Uh, and they're very delicious when you smoke them. Um, and that is a source of um, wonderful food that comes straight out of the mountain and straight out of this glacial aquifer covered in gravel that infiltrates so much water. And the building that I bought from the town for back taxes um, has a well in it that does 60 gallons per minute of water. The whole watershed is just backed up against route one, the great pressure of this uh, mountain full of water. And that's exactly the big mountain that um, a, a company of a Canadian junior mining company called Wolf Den Resources would like to and is in the process of mining. So here you go, it's really fun to get involved in fighting mines, you get all sorts of maps. Here was the original map that we saw in the work plan of Wolf Den Resources showing the place where they had purchased the mining rights from the previous mining company, who had purchased them from the previous mining company. And the owner of those rights is actually an 89 year old man who's um, I think in a nursing home and not very available but he had purchased those mineral rights when the mining company was called Sinalore LLC. Before that, it was called Denton Mines. And after that, it was called Golden Hope LLC. So a lot of community knowledge in this town says um, from experience, oh, the miners always come around when the price of metals go up and they dig around and they blow some holes up and they make some roads and they hire some people and they don't ever do anything. And so that's um, what is our, that's part of the mountain we have to move is 
um, the mountain of thinking nothing's going to happen. So here's the original site. As you can see, um, the wetlands are marked in green. This area is pocked with um, gravel pits, but also with wetlands. And as you can see, there are streams flowing off of here. Oh, you can't see my mouse probably. There's four streams, Ohio Brook, Wilson Stream, uh, Ohio Brook, Wilson Stream, Crow Brook, and I'm gonna move to the next slide because it might be on there. It's not, we'll get back to it. So here was the original show, shape I showed you in blue. And here is the new moves, the newly, um, the newly negotiated access. So the previous lands were mostly held by Pembroke and Timberland LLC. And now there's doing exploratory drilling, mining, road building, um, and, and um, blasting on land held by Down East Credit Union. Is that their social mission? to be part of an extraction, not sure. And then Worcester Holdings, which is a wreath company um, that has significant holdings all over Washington County and is quite famous for putting the wreaths on the Lincoln, uh, sorry, the Arlington Cemetery um, for veterans around the, around the country. Um, they are well known. So um, this is a little bit of what Wolfton is saying to their investors and gosh, are they talking to investors? Um, we looked up there financial records and they have spent $100,000 in Pembroke, according to their Canadian uh, reporting on mineral rights acquisition. Um, and they have gotten, um, I think it's 9.6% interest over to um, a company called Kinross, which is the fifth largest gold mining sorry, the fifth largest mining company in the world, which focuses a lot on gold. And Kinross was just recently in a big lawsuit against the state of Washington, not Washington DC, but Washington state. Um, it was called the Buckhorn Mine where a nine year mining project yielded 34 tons of gold, which was a value of $1.3 billion. But the cleanup costs have been left to the state of Washington who is now suing um, and the state of Washington is suing um, because Ken Ross did not comply with the Clean Water Act, which is a federal law, nor did they comply with the Washington Water Pollution Control Act, which is a state law. So this is the pattern of these mining companies that we're so worried about is that the contamination is left for the commun community to contend with at enormous cost. As you know, from the cleanup efforts in the Penobscot River, hundreds of millions of dollars being spent on contamination, um, you know, is not much consolation to the fish who have to live there and those of us who'd like to eat the fish. So anyway, this is a little bit of background. Next slide. So here again, as I, as I mentioned, you're starting to know the territory with us. Here's the Penamaquan River that splits in two right by the dam. Here are the gravels that are, um, and sand that constitute this infiltration um, into the aquifer, again, carved by glaciers. And then this sand and gravel was left by, by glaciers. Um, and that is part of why the groundwater concerns are so extreme. You can see in the bottom right in an illustration, this is from the groundwater. I'm so sorry, we have so many things to do around here. Um, this is the Pembroke Quadrangle Main Geological Survey. Oh my God, I'm so bad at this. Here we go. And here you can see how a well goes into bedrock. And then there's, um, and I just should say, my degree is in biology uh, conservation, not in geology, but we have a wonderful geological firm who is helping us prepare specific risk information for the town so that everyone has access to science that is in the interest of the town and in, in the interest of clean water. Um, and not just the you know, hoopla presented by these mining company representatives who are offering penny stocks um, to residents, to landowners, and who are very aggressive in their overtures even telling us when we, when, we, when we met them because they wanted access to the cores that were left by the previous iteration of the mining company. 
they left, I don't know, 16 tons of, of these long cores that had been drilled from the mountain in previous episodes of exploration. And they told us, well, we're going to leave it good for farming after we're done. We'll, we'll turn it back into a farm field and you can have young farmers on it. Well, um, no, thank you. And um, we have much to learn and to, and to share with townspeople who are going to have the, the op opportunity to vote on whether we should regulate mining in our town. Um, obviously, uh, Cobscook Bay is one of the last great scallop beds in the state of Maine. Um, and right now, every morning when I look out, there's 13 boats going out um, and grabbing these shellfish. We have clams. I grow oysters and seaweed. Um, and the, con the concern is that some of the closures have been already occurring here and there have been closures as well in the downspout or in the fallout in the drainage of, from the similar metal mine that was our most recent and most proximate example of polymetallic mining in Maine, which is in the vicinity of Blue Hill. Um, and that mine uh, is currently costing Maine taxpayers $750,000 a year in remediation. Now, Wolfden will say that they have a way more modern way of mining than what occurred in Blue Hill. Um, but as you can see, the water is all connected and um, the spills underground, overground affect us all and can penetrate one of these, um, you know, frankly, last remaining habitat for Atlantic salmon on the entire Eastern seaboard. This is one of the places where um, the United States has spent $30 million on updates to the culverts and to the bridges along Route 1, specifically because you have such a high return on investment in habitat that you have so much potential of this landscape to host fish, river fish, tom cod, brook trout, the Atlantic salmon, the elvers, that you, know, you give them space and they return. And so this is a place that we should not imperil with these risks. Our current population um, is about 600 people in Pembroke. Uh, one thing to say is you can walk right up there and you can access it yourself on foot. We've done that. We met the guys who are drilling. Um, they're from Georgia. They have set up a pumping station that draws water out of a wetland and draws the water up with a hose up to the drilling site where they then are drilling a shaft down into the water. What comes up from the drilling shaft is um, these kind of, it's kind of like muck. It's like a, it's a drilling, it's a drilling mixture and it's the rock itself. And then we've got nice pictures of the cigarette butts being put out right there in the site of this core being drilled. Um, it's pretty shocking how much they can trash the woods, how quickly. And now in every direction all around the mine, um, the core site is about 430 acres, but on the other side of Route 214 and on the other side of the Woods Road, um, extensive logging has been going on, um, really down to trees about like that. So there's a lot of clearing going on. The One of the proposals that they make is for this Pol uh, polarization. It's a technique that they use for seeing what kind of metal is down there. And in order to do that uh, magnetic um, tool, they have to clear the forest in these linear lines in order to make their um, surveys of this 60 kilometer long um, deposit of poly metals that they would like to mine. Anyway, just a reminder of why this is a wonderful place to live and farm and be a young farmer. There are um, about five new farms that I know of um, in the time since I moved here, which is five years ago. Um, and Washington County is still one of the most affordable places to you know, become a young farmer and participate in a wild food ecosystem. It's an ecosystem that is shared 
um, by a lot of people in Washington County, there's extreme amounts of natural resource based livelihood uh, in the form of tipping balsam fir, as I'm sure some of you know, is a $25 million industry in Washington County. Um, another big industry is uh, wood pulp and the expansion of the, of the wood mill in, on the St. Croix, um, thanks to a Chinese company, has, it's been a doubling of that mill and that's the biggest employer in the county. So these are, this is just to clarify, these are the alewives that we're scooping up from the river and then we gut them and then we smoke them and we make fish sauce. And then we also harvest um, algae uh, from our sea farm and oysters and vegetables. And this is the beautiful bay that we are operating inside of that we want to protect. Um, for all of those who live here for ourselves and for all those in the future. So here we are, just to remind you, connected to um, Cobscook Bay, runs into Pasmaquoddy Bay, runs into the Bay of Fundy, runs into the Gulf of Maine. We're all um, a part of this aquatic connectivity funding um, to help support the fish return in this region. Um, we have a community meeting on this Sunday. If you're local and you wanna come, we're gonna wear masks and we're gonna sit together in a circle. It's a meeting that was requested by Dwayne Thomas who said we need to all get on the same page. So if you wanna get on the same page also, um, the school just called and said we're allowed to do it at the auditorium of the Pembroke Elementary School, which is 1.2 miles away from the core of the mine. Um, and they're concerned also about the sound that they hear from the school of blasting and the grinding of a mountain into dust that would imperil the children of our community. I think that's it for me. And I stick around because there's gonna be lots of questions and I have, I'm sure forgotten 10 of my notes that I wanted to say. So ask good questions and I'm so grateful to pass the microphone to Corey. Thank you very much, Severin. Really, really nice job. Um, I'm going to, uh try to pull up my slides now. Um, let's see, I'm gonna turn yours off Severin and uh, pull up mine. Just bear with me for a moment, everybody. Thank you for your patience. Let's see. Oh, I have a can, can everybody see uh, this slide? Yes. Okay, great. All right, um, thanks Severin for, for kicking us off and for the introductions uh, to this, uh, this subject matter. Um, I'm gonna be approaching this from, from a slightly different perspective. Um, I'll start with, with introducing myself in Passamaquoddy. Ndolu is Corey Hinton, New JL, Portland, Anuda Beggs, Zibayag, Naga Balunz, Best Good of God Mill. My name is Corey Hinton, I live in Portland, I am from Zibayak, from the Francis family, and I am Passamaquoddy. I am uh, a lawyer for the Passamaquoddy tribe. I'm here today on behalf of the Passamaquoddy tribe at Pleasant Point, and I am a Passamaquoddy citizen. Um, and I'm going to be discussing uh, uh, over these next few slides um, a little bit of background on Wolf Den and, and why, from my perspective, uh, I believe that they're here in, in, in our homeland. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the indigenous perspective um, on, on not just Big Silver, the, the Pembroke mine, but also um, Wolf Den's uh, other proposed mine in, in what's now called Pickett Mountain. Um, so, as folks can see on this slide, um, I, I put down some bullets, my best attempt at sort of summarizing at a, at a high level why, why I believe uh, Wolfden is targeting Maine. Um, uh, first and foremost, Wolfden is uh, it's a privately owned uh, junior mining company, as Severin said. Um, it is uh, a company that has obligations to uh, both shareholders and to large corporate investors. 
Therefore, Wolfton, first and foremost, is about profits and returns. Um, it's specifically targeting Maine uh, in that vein um, because there is considered to be uh, a presence of commercially valuable um, polymetallic resources, um, namely lead, uh, zinc, copper, gold, and silver. Um, there are two primary projects that Wolf Den is pursuing right now in Maine. Pickett Mountain, um, which I've misspelled here, um, is uh, perhaps the most notable project that folks may have read about. Um, Wolf Den's proposing to develop uh, what would primarily be a, a zinc mine uh, over approximately 6,800 acres on Pickett Mountain, which is in close proximity to, uh, to uh, Mount Katahdin, which is a sacred place for the Wabanaki people and the Penobscot people in particular. Um, and this would be right near the, the newly designated, fairly newly designated Katahdin Woods and Waters Natural Monument. And the mine itself would be on approximately 600 acres. Um, Wolf Den is also seeking, as uh, we've been discussing, developing a mine uh, in what's called Big Hill or now Big Silver, um, which is uh, in the town of Pembroke in Washington County. And here in particular, Wolf Den is looking to develop uh, a source of uh, gold and silver. Um, one of the other reasons that at least Wolf Den has said that they are looking at Maine uh, in particular is that Maine has a fairly new mining law. Um, which Wolfden believes has um, really clarified how uh, private enterprises can conduct mining in Maine. Um, it's quite ironic to me that this law was intended to be um, throw up some, some pretty serious roadblocks to mining, and yet here is a foreign company believing that this law actually makes it easier to mine in Maine than previously. So uh, Wolfden pretty clearly believes that, that this new law provides clarity and it's provided an opportunity for exploration, mining exploration and, and development. Um, and, uh, and here's a quote that I added from Wolf Den CEO, Ron Little. He said that this new law has revived uh, interest in mining in Maine and that the law has shown that there is significant up, upside in this jurisdiction for its stakeholders. In other words, Wolfden believes this, this new law shows that there's opportunity in Maine to create corporate revenues for its shareholders. Uh, and the third primary reason that, that Wolfden has uh, latched onto Maine, and this, these are the words of Wolfden CEO, they believe that there are no indigenous rights in Maine. Um, now, that's not true. Um, and we could talk about that a little bit, but I just wanna draw a pretty stark contrast here between Canada where Wolfden originates from and, and the United States and, and in Maine in particular. In Canada, First Nations essentially have the ability to, um, to provide a sort of veto power over um, many types of commercial development, industrial developments within their Aboriginal territories. And so doing the type of mining that, that Wolfden is proposing here in Canada um, would be um, potentially met with uh, much stiffer um, opposition from First Nations that have very legitimate and concrete uh, mechanisms in Can Canadian law to oppose uh, and stop mining projects. Unfortunately, in Maine, the state of Maine has essentially, uh, not essentially, it has very directly oppressed and suppressed indigenous people since the state of Maine became a state. Um, it's essentially been Maine's economic prerogative to make clear to all manners of industry that you can come to Maine, you can take our natural resources, you can exploit them, you can pollute them in the name of your own corporate profits. And we'll help you do this by essentially marginalizing native peoples. Um, the, the state of Maine, um, as many folks know, or don't know actually, um, has some of the most um, negative laws with respect to tribal rights out of anywhere in the United States. Maine um, likes to lead by the motto of, you know, Maine first. Um, but when it comes to indigenous rights, Maine is damn near the back of the pack. It's been Maine's policy, as I said, to essentially suppress tribal rights. And it has created this impression for foreign corporations like Wolfden that you can come to Maine and not have to worry about impacts uh, of your activities on, on tribal uh, populations. 
Um, and my presence here and what my presentation is going to cover in the next slides should make clear that there are indigenous rights in Maine and that there are indigenous people whose voices are extremely important, contrary to what the state of Maine has said for generations now. There are four federally recognized tribal nations in what is now called Maine, the Passamaquoddy tribe, the Penobscot nation, the Holton Band of Maliseets, and the Mi'kmaq nation, the Mi'kmaq. Um, there is an additional Wabanaki nation, the Abenakis, which is no longer present in Maine. Um, but collectively, all of these nations are referred to as Wabanaki nations and in, in the past have um, politically organized in what is referred to as the Wabanaki um, Confederacy. Um, Wabanaki or Wabanakiig in our language means um, the place of the dawn, the place where the sun rises first. Um, and our orientation on the water um, and looking east in particular is extraordinarily important. The Passamaquoddy tribe, of which I am a citizen, has two communities in the United States, um, Pleasant Point, or Zibayig, uh, and Indian Township, or Madakmiguk. Uh, Zibayig, uh, which is where I am from, means the place at the edge. And uh, you might be able to see on this map here, although it's a little bit small, if you look to the sort of middle right side of this image, you'll see Pleasant Point, um, Indian Township, would be uh, going up Route 1 about 50 miles uh, north of here. Um, and Pleasant Point, um, as I said, it means the place at the edge. Um, you'll see that there is a little bit of a bridge uh, causeway that comes off of, of Pleasant Point. Um, this is a road that was built in uh, about the, the 40s or 50s or so. Um, and this road uh, never used to be there. Um, and the causeway was constructed in, in efforts to harness the tidal power um, that, that Severin um, mentioned earlier, um, but there was no causeway. And so this was considered the edge and that's why Zibayak means the place at the edge. Um, Pleasant Point um, is as, uh, as the crow flies about 13, 13 and a half miles um, from the big silver location. I dropped a pin here on this map, it's a rough location, but just to give you a sense of the sort of rough geography of the area. Um, one of the, there, there are many reasons why, um, why it's important to oppose uh, mining efforts um, in places like uh, Down East Maine, um, where there are extraordinarily valuable and precious natural resources. Um, but I'm going to spend a little bit of time here on two very specific reasons. The first and perhaps the most foremost reason for the purposes of my people and my client is safe drinking water. Uh, safe drinking water in, in this area of Maine uh, generally comes from two sources. Folks, uh, many folks will have wells that are drawn from groundwater sources. Um, that's the majority of, uh, of the water that's used for, for domestic purposes and, and most all purposes really in this area. But there are communities, including Pleasant Point, Perry, and Eastport, which are essentially the neighbors to Pembroke, that receive water from a uh, state chartered and regulated water district called the Passamaquoddy Water District. To be really clear, this water district is not owned by the Passamaquoddy tribe. It does bear the tribe's name, um, but it is, uh, a, it is an instrumentality of the state of Maine. Um, the water supply for, uh, for this water district, and I'm going to just go back one slide really quickly, um, comes from uh, this lake. You see Boyden's Lake, and although you can't really see it too well, if you were to zoom in, you would notice that there's a little reservoir that comes out of Boyden's Lake. Um, and this reservoir supplies uh, a municipal supply of water for these communities that I mentioned. Um, the PWD's water supply is this reservoir that is increasingly shallow. Um, it is, I believe, at its greatest depth, somewhere between like 10 and 15 feet deep. It used to be somewhere like 30 feet deep. Um, and because it is, uh, it is shallow and because it's fed by a surface water source, a lake that is um, pretty densely populated, the water quality of the water delivered by this district is generally pretty poor. Um, it's prone to very dramatic swings in water quality. 
at times of year, the water can be brown, it can be black, it can be all shades of, um, you know, sort of like uh, fluorescent blues and greens or yellows, depending on what's going on in the system. The odor of the water um, fluctuates as well. At times, it smells like rotten eggs. At times, it smells like chlorine. Um, and the chlorine is a strong indicator that there's a high presence of chloroform um, in the water. Chloroform uh, is a pretty nasty carcinogen that can kill you. It is cancer causing and it's a byproduct of, byproduct of cleaning. And so essentially this water supply is, is quite dirty. They have to clean it with large amounts of chlorine and that produces chloroform, which is a part of a group of carcinogens known as trihalomethanes. Water testing over many years has shown that this water supply is at times um, pretty unsafe to drink. Um, and that's in particular during the sort of uh, high precipitation months in the spring and the summer. Um, a little over a decade ago, the Passamaquoddy tribe, recognizing that the water we were receiving was quite unsafe to drink, received some federal funds to conduct a water quality study and to specifically look at the feasibility of replacing the inadequate um, water source um, with other potential sources. And there were a whole range of alternates that were looked at. Um, there was a look at upgrades to the existing supply, you know, essentially how do you clean the water better? There was a look at using um, tribally owned sources of water. And then there was also uh, one, potentially the, the best supply of water was identified. And that's from the Penamaquan Aquifer, which connects to Penamaquan Lake and numerous streams and waterways in the area. Um, as that relates to this mine, um, this aquifer, the lake, and all of these streams are in the immediate vicinity of the proposed um, drilling locations. Um, and one of the problems that we've run into in trying to assess this project is that it's not exactly clear, it hasn't been until pretty recently, where precisely blasting and drilling is going to be taking place. So it's been a little bit hard to gauge precisely how the mine would, um, would impact water in the area. But what's very clear is that there is a very high presence of water in the area, both underground water that's been identified as a drinking water source um, and the sort of surface, uh, surface waterways that, um, that Severin mentioned. And they are all at risk as a result of, uh, of this mine being in, in very close proximity, knowing that this mine would essentially be, um, you know, drilling deep down into the earth, potentially reaching um, to the aquifer or being very, very close to the aquifer. So the, the first, um, you know, major impact is really a threat to drinking water. This is a, a, a region of, of the United States. Um, a rural area where there are very well-known drinking water problems. And yet um, here is a potential solution to that drinking water problem. And here is a foreign corporation seeking to conduct mining that could um, quite easily um, impact in a, in a very negative and potentially permanent way this drinking water supply if it were ever tapped for that purpose. There are other broader environmental quality problems that we see here. Um, and this will, a lot of this will track back to what Severin had talked about before. Um, but I just wanted to take a step back and just acknowledge that this really isn't, in my mind, about just Pembroke. This really is about um, Wolfden's attempts to not just mine in Pembroke, but also in Pickett Mountain. And what's sort of ironic about their attempt here is that their efforts would be pretty squarely in the ancestral territory of three of the four federally recognized tribes of Maine. Obviously, I'm here to talk about the Passamaquoddy impact, but the, the Holton Band of Maliseets and the Penobscots um, have already weighed in regarding the Pick and Mountain Mine. Um, they've uh, highlighted the fact that the mine would essentially sit um, smack between the, both the Penobscot River and the Manawamked River watersheds, which are extraordinarily ecologically important watersheds that have um, traditionally provide sources of food um, and of life to the people, to the animals that live in the area. Um, the concerns of the tribes with respect to uh, Pick and Malin were mostly that um, Wolfden has not proposed or not really made clear what their plan is to remove waste from the site. Um, and so the concerns 
at Pickin Mountain are that um, the failure uh, of, of uh, Wolf then to really show a plan to, to remove wastewater, to deal with all of the waste that will come from this project provides a very clear and present risk to, uh, to um, water quality and to broader environmental quality in this part of central Maine where Pickin Mountain is located. Um, bringing us more locally to, um, to Passamaquoddy territory again, the, the concerns are similar in terms of overall drinking water quality and broader environmental concerns. Um, but the, the spe specific culture of the Passamaquoddy people um, and the proximity of the Passamaquoddy people to Big Silver makes this threat particularly potent as it relates to, to Big Silver. Um, Passamaquoddy, um, in our language, we say Beskida Magadi, uh, means people who spear pollock. Pollock is a sea run fish, a saltwater fish, um, and it is one of, uh, of many, many forms of marine resources that the Passamaquoddy people traditionally relied, relied upon. Eels, clams, um, the alewives or the herring that Severin mentioned, whale, scallops. Um, these are the foods that my ancestors relied upon to survive in at certain times of year um, in this place that we now call Pembroke. Um, and all of these marine resources are still found to one degree or another in Copscook Bay, which leads into Passamaquoddy Bay, which sits really immediately adjacent to, uh, to my community at Sipayak. Um, and these are the foods that are both relied on for immediate sustenance in this region um, for not just tribal members, but also, you know, as Severin mentioned, herself and, and, her, um, and her friends and, uh, and colleagues, um, but also for, for commercial foods. And, and we really believe one of our big problems with this proposal is that it really fails to account for the broader environmental impact of the mine. Um, and we can get into some of these details at a, at a later point, um, but Wolfden has a, a habit of not providing a lot of details and we think sort of skirting the real impacts of their work. And we feel that that's most dangerous in this particular region, which provides food both to the citizens of this area and to, um, and to consumers of seafood more broadly in, in, uh, in the world. Um, and so here's a quote that um, I wanted to just share and, and read. And this is a quote from 1887 from a gentleman named Lewis Mitchell, who was a, a Passamaquoddy man who spoke to the Maine legislature in, in the 1880s. And I'm just going to read this. This is paraphrasing a bit, but just consider today how many rich men there are in Callis, in St. Stephen, Milltown, Machias, East, East Machias, Columbia, Cherryfield, Pembroke and other lumbering towns. We see a good many of them worth thousands and even millions of dollars. We ask ourselves how they make the most of their money. Answer is they make it off lumber or timber once owned by the Passamaquoddy. We plainly see the efforts of the Passamaquoddy during this struggle mentioned before to help gain our independence. How many of their privileges have been broken? How many of their lands have been taken from them by authority of the state? Now we say to ourselves, these Indians ought to have everything they ask for. They deserve assistance. Now this plainly shows how much worse a people of 530 souls are stripped of their whole country, their privileges upon which they depend for their living, all of the land they claim to own now being only 10 acres. Now look at this yourselves and see whether I am right or wrong. If you see any insulting language in my speech, I ask your pardon. I don't mean to insult anybody, but to simply tell you of our wrong. I, um, I share this quote because this message was delivered in the 19th century to the state of Maine. After the Passamaquoddy people had seen their lands taken, their, the fish that they caught no longer available due to the damming and overall environmental degradation of the, re of the region. And here's a Passamaquoddy going to the state, hat in hand, saying, please, You've taken everything. Can't you at least try to help preserve what's left? And you know, I would say that at this time, um, our region was, was pretty much devastated. There's been some environmental restoration. There are active efforts by all the tribes in the area to restore their watersheds. But here we see, because of companies like Wolf Den Resources, 
that many of these lessons that Lewis Mitchell tried passing along to Maine legislators, to Maine public, have really not um, truly crept in. We see Maine passing laws that it likes to trumpet as being some of the most environmentally progressive in the country. Well, newsflash, those same laws are being considered a, a basis to, uh, to conduct mining. And these laws come on the tail end of, of centuries, of generations and generations of Maine really openly encouraging industrial exploitation and destruction of the environment in the name of uh, corporate profits. Um, and so all of these lessons, everything that Lewis Mitchell is talking about is 100% relevant today. And I would ask everybody to really carry this message with you when you leave this presentation. At the end of the day, what are the Passamaquoddy seeking? What are the Wabanaki seeking when, whenever we're pushing for environmental quality? We're seeking to protect our ancestral homelands. We're looking to protect the earth, the, the, the plants, the fish, the animals that have sustained us and have sustained our people since time immemorial. We're hoping that this place where we have lived since time immemorial can continue to be a safe place for future generations of our people so that we can call, so they can call it home the same way that we have always called it home. And really, at the end of the day, that's what it's about. It's about fighting for, for a stronger, healthier environment so that all of us, human, plant, and animal, can all live in symbiosis and can all survive together uh, in balance with one another. So uh, with that, um, I think that Severin and I are, uh, are available to answer some questions if folks have them. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Corey and Severin. Um, I think this is an amazing thing for us to be talking about and learning about and exploring more ways to, that we can, um, you know, to do everything we can to fight this. Um, so I wanted to just go back all the way up to the top of the chat really quickly. Um, I think, Severin, there was a question about the, the meeting you mentioned on the 12th and whether there would be a, like a remote access code I mean, a link or um, if like if it would be virtual at all or if it's only in person. Uh, there'll be plenty more meetings. Um, and we can talk about that. I just have to figure out if the raccoons ate the AV cord again. Oh, no, we're going to try to do it at the school, this one. So um, if you want to, you can email cleanwater at greenhorns.org which is our website, which is our email address. Um, PembrokeCleanWater.com is the Pembroke Clean Water Committee um, where we are posting a lot of information. And you can also look at the Friends of Cobscook Bay, which is another group that's formed to protect Cobscook Bay and has been doing a great job canvassing in the community. Um, I think we're gonna be, I, I, I will try to do it. The answer to your question is I will try. Can I bring up a couple of things that came up during Corey's thing for me? Sure. Um, so one thing to just say is that in the past five months, all the three gas stations along Route 1 that were previously locally owned have been bought up by Shell. So we all of our three local gas stations have just been purchased by Shell. Um, Number two, I wanted to mention that there are significant conservation interests here in Cobscook Bay who are not yet working necessarily on this mine issue because they're not sure if it is their mission yet and that we need to rally into the mission. Um, we have Nature Conservancy, we have Down East Coastal Conservancy, we have Maine Coast Heritage Trust, we have Cobscook Shores, we have the Moosehorn Wildlife Refuge, it's um, about a quarter of Washington County is under some form of conservation easement. Again, because there's such extraordinary wildlife habitat, the you know we have the highest density of bald eagles of any place in the lower United States. We have minke whales, we have right whales who come here. We have humpback whales, we have finback whales, we have you know porpoises. Like this is a place where um, we make space and nature is alive. And so I think there's a major work of convincing more partners in the conservation community to join in because the threat that Wolfton presents is not just to our water here, it's actually for opening up Maine um, and other rivers in Maine as well. 
to this poisonous industry. As I'm sure you know, mining is the most poisonous industry in the world. And, um, and the poisons are indelible. So the article that I wanted to, to highlight that came out last week in the Boston Herald um, and then it was posted all over the country, um, and I hope we do a rebuttal to it this week. Basically, it was a, um, an article about a lithium mine in Newry, Maine, which is allegedly a $1.5 billion lithium deposit. And the article said, how is it that Maine's restrictive mining laws prevent this needed mineral from entering our green energy economy? That's a industry line that's repeated all over the world as investment pours into these extractive industries to try and intensify the mining, uh, the sites of mining and the sites um, for investment to flow. Um, and the restrictive mining laws that we have in Maine um, will require a massive coalition in order to keep that industry from trying to open the, the, the law up further. So I think it's a very important moment to make sure that we have a very big, very strong coalition um, working together. I had one more thing, but I better shut up. I'll let Corey say something. Oh yeah. I, um, I don't really have anything to add, um, but I'm, I'm happy to, we only have a few minutes left. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions that um, came in from the audience that we might be able to answer. Um, I think there's one from um, Nikki Sakara about, um, and Nikki, do you wanna unmute and ask your question about uh, Passamaquoddy Water District and um, combined efforts with Sepiak? Are you still there, Nikki? Oops, yeah, hi, sorry. Yeah, I was just curious about um, when you were talking about the Passamaquoddy Water District and Spiak not having access to quality water, if um, the, um, the Water District ever thought of considered exercising their powers of eminent domain to uh, access better quality water and then maybe also combine that with providing um, Spiak with better quality water. That is a great question, Nikki. Um, I, I don't think, and we meet with PWD on uh, a semi-regular basis, and I've never heard any discussion about them using their powers of eminent domain. Um, they, um, out of all those alternate supplies that were identified, um, I think the only one that, that might require that sort of use would be this Pembroke supply, unless there was some sort of you know, land acquisition or transfer worked out with the municipality or landowners. Um, and so I don't think the conversations advanced to that level. Um, I think there's generally sort of a, an aversion to um, creating local rough, uh, ruffles and local politics. Um, so like the PWD manager is um, an elected official in the town of Perry. And, and all of the board is elected from the municipalities in the area, although Prumbrook is notably not a part of the district. Um, so I think it, it would be possible to use powers of eminent domain. We're trying to encourage um, uh, less sort of blunt tools. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, we're, we're hoping that there'll be a, a pretty big upgrade to the water supply um, a cleaning um, additive added to the process there. Um, but, you know, our efforts here are, are not so much making this water supply in Pembroke a water supply right now. It's more ensuring that the water's there forever, right? I mean, who knows what the needs of this region will be? You know, maybe we can see in 10 or 20 years, but how about 100 or 200? Um, if there's mining at any point, in, how, how, in any window of time, the risk that this water supply will be forever poisoned will just go up dramatically. And so this isn't so much about securing a supply as it is protecting a supply, um, but your, your point about eminent domain is a really good one. Um, and it's one that we'll definitely be keeping in mind. Thank you so much. And then I think Pam um, had a question about um, how someone who doesn't live in Pembroke anymore can help if anyone has thoughts on that. 
We have lots of um, lots of things to do. We'd love more collaborators. And I just want to say thank you so much to Alex, who's updated the website. Thank you so much to Gavin, who's updated the website. Thank you much to Colin, who did videos and graphics. There's been a lot of volunteerism um, and trying to mobilize and um, raise awareness because it's been a hard challenge getting anyone to really, it's not fun to have to confront this poison. And so how do we make it fun? I don't know, but we're, we're going to try and um, we'll try with you. One thing I, I just wanted to add is I've been speaking with a geologist down in Rockland who's been geology for 50 years. He said the standards that are being used now to, to measure the protective, um, the protective measures that are being created around the, the tailings and the leachate and the um, um, ore, the spent ore and its storage, which are, which are under the mining law described as dry stack. Well, that's all very well with current weather conditions, but what about the weather of a hundred years? What about when it rains seven inches overnight? What about when it rains and rains and rains and blows out all the roads? Um, you know, with climate change, coming and this region, like many regions, experiencing unusual weather patterns, um, that reaction of cold, wet place with the sulfur, high sulfur metallic ore creates sulfuric acid and that sulfuric acid ca uh, carves into the rock and it loosens heavy metals. It loosens lead, cadmium, arsenic, and those are poisons to life that persist in the environment. You know, one of the things we've learned about is the shellfish here are getting the settled out heavy metals from all the generating plants, the, the coal and industry from the upper Midwest and the East Coast that blows down East and then deposits on our big, beautiful clam flats. And those metals are present in our shellfish and, and they stay present. So um, anyway, the solution to pollution is life and let's let life continue living here. Um, in one of these places that it really can live. And where I think if we're really honest, I mean, I talked to um, Aaron Bell at the plant sale in the spring and he's there, you know, selling all these plants for everyone's gardens. I mean, it's like the, the food security moment of the county where everyone gets their gardens every year and everybody's growing gardens and especially during COVID. And he said, there's probably 300 more families that he's feeding in Washington County than there were before COVID. So like other places that are good habitat, I think we should expect that more humans will migrate and need this water and more animals will migrate and need this water. So that long-term perspective that Corey brings is, thank you. I just, um, I just received a question uh, to me directly and I wanna just try to um, answer it really quickly and then I have to jump off. But the question was um, whether there are opportunities coming to address this um, with Department of Environmental Protection or in the state. Um, and that's a perfect sort of jumping off point from here. The answer is absolutely yes. Um, there are going to be um, some local efforts as Severin mentioned and folks should um, please, you know, keep, keep, uh, keep your eyes on your email for opportunities to sign on to petitions or, or letters of, of opposition, stuff like that. At the DEP, um, I think there's a pretty strong sense that um, among some of us that have looked very hard at this, that DEP is not being as stringent and in holding um, Wolfton accountable for the potential impacts. In other words, they haven't really asked the hard questions. Um, and there's a lot of ambiguity around what Wolfton's going to do, where they're going to do it, and what the impact is. And so I would encourage people to reach out to the Department of Environmental Protection, reach out to the commissioner and let her know and let the governor know that mining by foreign corporations in Maine is not good for Maine. It's bad for, for all of us, human and non-human. And I would also say that there are going to be opportunities, sort of little preview in the upcoming legislative session to support very direct ways to protect the water in Pembroke. And I don't wanna you know, give too much on that front, um, but we will be sharing information in the next few weeks or month or so about how folks can directly weigh in with the legislature um, in support of, of policy efforts to really 
um, strengthen Maine's mining laws and to make it much harder for anyone to mine um, in a way that would do harm to uh, our precious people. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Um, Thank you. Yeah, there's a hand. <laughs> Um, mine it if you want to come off mute and ask your question. And I know we're kind of running over. Um, so if people, have yeah, to I'm up, sorry, I was having trouble with my system here. Um, of North. So, Corey, what you're saying is exactly what we're encountering in fighting these industrial scale fish farms on the coast. Um, and the issues are are broadly identical in terms of impact on water quality, impact on wild fisheries, impact on community and, and indigenous people's rights. Um, I'm thinking that we should uh, cast a, a wide net and bring these issues together and say to the governor and the DEP, you know, you need to stop this. You, you need to go back to that letter you read and read that this is the history of Maine bending over for foreign extraction. And it does us no good in the near term or in the long term, and it needs to stop. Amen. Um, yeah, I, I support that statement. Um, and yes, I, I do think that um, that the state of Maine as a whole needs to do a better job, particularly when it comes into creating the impression that Maine is open for foreign business um, and Maine is open for foreign businesses to destroy our home. Um, I think that's a message that, you know, everyone should feel comfortable carrying to the governor. Um, don't tell her I sent you, um, but Please feel free to uh, to use your powers as uh, as citizens um, and as uh, people with voices. Um, and so, with that, I, I need to jump. But um, please uh, do stay in touch. I look forward to working with all of you. Gee, while well, I want up, Chich. Thank you, Corey, so much. Yeah, thank you, Corey, and thank you, Severin and Becky, and everybody who's working on these issues and for this amazing presentation. I think this was. Great, and unfortunately we are out of time and I know that people will probably still have questions. I know we have two questions in the chat from Sarah and Suzanne that I've written down. We will get those answered offline. If you have other questions that come up and want to reach out, um, we can get those answered as well. We're and I will happy be to welcome you to come and see for yourself and walk the mine roads with us and strategize and photograph and write letters and canvas. Anybody who comes is welcome. We have plenty of warm spots to you to sleep and good food to feed you. Yes, and yeah, and I will be including all of the information that um, is up on the screen right now and the uh, email address, the <laughs> greenwater at greenhorns.org um, so people can get in touch and stay, get involved. <laughs> um, and thank you, yeah, thank you again to our speakers and thank you everybody who came to our community conversations. And don't forget to you know, keep in touch with us so you can follow the main chapter on social media and uh, you can find us online at sierraclub.org slash me. All right, have a wonderful rest of your Tuesday, everybody. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Thanks, Megan. Thank you.